Welcome to the Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart Podcast. Each week, we interview the best and brightest in physical therapy, wellness, and entrepreneurship. We give you cutting-edge information you need to live your best life, healthy, wealthy, and smart. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Karen Litzy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the final episode of 2018. And today's episode is brought to you by NetHealth. They have created a new online forum called the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum. It's all about habits and initiatives that juice up your attendance, revenue, workflows, documentation, basically everything you need to run a successful practice. We believe that a better connected rehab therapy profession has the power to help more people. So jump in, subscribe, and join the conversations today. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com healthy, and we will have that link in the show notes. So on to, the, to today's show. So this was recorded like so long ago, and I apologize to Andrew Vygotsky and Nicholas Rolnick for not getting this out sooner, but... Now that I think about it, I think it's a great way to end the year. So this episode is all about Andrew's paper, Interpreting Single Amplitude in Sports and Rehab Sciences. We talk about what information you can conclude from a surface EMG study, the limitations of surface EMG research, what to look for in a surface EMG methods section. So just remember, it isn't always what it seems. So more on the guests. Andrew Vygotsky, he's been on the podcast before. He is currently a PhD student in biomedical engineering at Northwestern University, where he studies neuromuscular biomechanics. He has published papers in areas ranging from rehabilitation to surface EMG methodology and biomechanical modeling. His dissertation works aims to understand the neuromechanical implications of muscular heterogeneities. Yeah, that's right. Now, more on Dr. Nicholas Rolnick. He's a licensed physical therapist, the founder of the Human Performance Mechanic, and the co-founder of Blood Flow Restriction Pros. He received his doctorate of physical therapy with academic honors from Columbia University. He teaches across the United States as a clinical instructor for Smart Tools Plus and is an adjunct faculty member at Concordia University, Chicago, where he teaches kinesiology one and two in their MS Applied Exercise Science program. He also speaks nationally and internationally on the use of blood flow restriction therapy for various diagnoses, diagnoses and populations. So a huge thank you to Nick and Andrew, and of course, a huge apology for not getting this out sooner. But like I said, I think it's a great way to end 2018, and be sure to catch us on January 7th, 2019. We have all new episodes some pretty amazing people coming on the podcast. I'm really excited to kick off uh, the podcast in 2018 with a very special guest on January 7th. So everyone, thank you so much for listening. On behalf of myself and the whole team at Healthy, Wealthy, and Smart, I want to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for downloading and listening and know that I appreciate it. I don't take any of it for granted And I wish you all a very happy and healthy 2019. Hey, Andrew and Nick, welcome back to the podcast. I'm happy to have you both. Yeah, thanks for having me, Karen. Thanks, appreciate it. Anytime. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about, Andrew, a paper that you were lead author on, Interpreting Signal Amplitudes in Surface EMG Studies in Sport and Rehab Sciences. So before we get into the bulk of the paper, what is the why behind why you and your group decided to do this review? Yeah, so we noticed looking through a lot of the sport and rehab science literature that there are a lot of EMG studies that are meant to be interpreted. Uh, The authors imply longitudinal adaptations from their uh, results, and we felt that that wasn't justified. In addition especially as of late, the authors, or many authors, try to conclude acute mechanistic variables that cannot necessarily be interpreted from uh, just the amplitude of the electromyogram. So we thought it was necessary to kind of clarify, especially for applied exercise scientists, coaches, and physical therapists, what exactly 
these EMG amplitudes are, what what makes them what they are, and what can be concluded from these signals and what cannot be concluded from these signals. And we felt that many of the papers previously published, for example, by notable biomechanists such as uh, Carlo De Luca, um, Peter Cavanaugh, and others, that they communicated these things, but it was done very esoterically and very technically, and we wanted to kind of bring it down to a level that's easy to understand and easy to grasp for these uh, applied clinicians and scientists. And what did you find as a result of this review um, about maybe what researchers are doing well and what maybe they're doing not so well? So we didn't exactly quantify the number of studies that attempted to draw longitudinal conclusions or draw conclusions that could not be drawn from the EMG amplitudes. But what we did was we went over what we have seen be reported in the past. So things like motor unit recruitment, things like muscle activation, things like force sharing and force muscle force production characteristics. Uh, so those would be grouped in the, ac the acute variables. And then we also discuss longitudinal variables, so specifically strength and muscle hypertrophy. So because we've seen these things uh, be reported in the past, we thought it was necessary to just focus on these few outcomes because this is what we perceive to be the most pressing issues within the literature. So it wasn't that we concluded something from our review. We thought it was necessary to point out that these things exist in the literature and that they these outcomes cannot be concluded from these results. But we also went on to say, okay, there are things that we can conclude from surface EMG amplitudes, um, such as things like the binary excitation of a muscle, whether or not a muscle is on or off, or the timing of activation, or things like comparative, sorry, the timing of excitation or comparative excitation uh, so whether a muscle is more or less excited um, during a given, let's say, exercise or during a given task. Um, so those things are things that can be concluded with uh, a number of considerations that we discuss in a great amount of detail. And I, you said this a couple of times, the acute variables, longitudinal variables, or perhaps acute studies or... Mm -hmm or longitudinal studies, can you just kind of explain what that means and why that's important as f in the context of surface EMGs? Sure. So for longitudinal variables, they would be an outcome that occurs over a period of time. So something like muscle hypertrophy, it doesn't occur after one session in the gym. It occurs after weeks, months of working out. Same thing with strength. And then for acute variables, there would be something that occurs within the session itself. So something like when you're actually contracting the muscle, how many motor units are recruited, or when you're contracting the muscle, which muscles are contributing to that force that produces that joint moment um, from which somebody can measure strength. Uh, so those would be the acute variables. And from your review of all of these different studies, how do these acute variables or longitudinal variables kind of affect what we may do as a clinician? Right, so what's being implied from a lot of these studies is that we can, or they may compare a number of exercises and say, okay, this one elicits greater EMG amplitude, therefore it may be more beneficial or less beneficial for hypertrophy or strength outcomes. And what we were trying to communicate was that, no, there are not really any studies validating these claims. So it comes back to a surrogate outcome or predictive validity, uh, which kind of means if, if something has greater EMG amplitude, can we actually use that as a surrogate measure for greater hypertrophy to occur or greater strength gains to be elicited from a given exercise or from a given loading scheme or something along those lines. And we critique that approach quite, quite rigorously. And in doing so, we challenge hundreds, maybe even thousands of studies that have been 
approach from this perspective in an attempt to conclude or at least imply a longitudinal outcome? So, for instance, if we can take that to, let's say, a clinical application, um, if you have an EMG study that says exercise A is the quote-unquote, best exercise or for recruitment of muscular activation for glute medius, mm -hmm. let's just say. And they're using and doing, measuring that by an uh, isometric exercise. From a clinical standpoint, well, we may just look at that. And, you know, I've had these conversations with Neil O'Connell that most therapists will read the beginning, the results, and the discussion, and maybe not so much all the stuff in between. And I think that's pretty common. Mm -hmm. So if you're a clinician and you're seeing, well, this is the quote-unquote best exercise or the exercise that's going to have the most recruitment of muscle activity, and then is it safe to say as a clinician we can then just extrapolate that into exercise for our patients and not have to delve any deeper? Right, so I think it goes back to what the clinician wants to get out of that exercise. If they do want to elicit a greater hypertrophy or strength response from that given exercise, I would say that EMG is probably the next, not the best way to infer that. Um, ideally, we would have longitudinal studies showing that one exercise or one loading scheme or whatever variable of interest is greater than another, um, the comp uh, comparator. So I would urge practitioners not to go or make clinical decisions primarily based off these surface EMG or any acute, uh, acute type of measure, especially when they want a longitudinal outcome for a given patient. Let's talk about, and I know this is probably going to open up a lot of interesting discussion, but you've said it a couple of times, so let's talk about it. And that's that difference between strength and hypertrophy, um, which I know, and, and Nick, feel free to jump in here. Um, I saw a little bit of this on social media, and are, do, I guess the, the question is, is strength and hypertrophy, do they go hand in hand? Are they running sort of two lanes running together linearly? As you, uh, as you strength train? Uh, I would certainly say that the relationship is not necessarily linear. Um, it depends how you test strength or how you define strength in a certain context. So is it maximum squat, back squat strength, or is it maximum isometric strength in a dynamometer? These are two very different things. One has much more of a skill component than the other. So within biomechanics, we have a method of modeling how a muscle contributes to a joint or creating a joint torque. And that's basically the activation of that muscle times its physiological cross-sectional area, times its moment arm, times uh, the normalized muscle force, which is related to specific tension and lateral force transmission, a number of things go into that. Um, so all of these different things are going to affect it, and hypertrophy will primarily affect just one of those variables, the physiological cross-sectional area. So it's very reductionist to say that these things are hand in hand, but from an engineering and modeling perspective, they are related. It's just how you account for the different variables in a given experimental design or um, how you may optimize the contribution of each variable in a training program. Okay, and from what you saw in doing this review as far as surface EMGs and how, it, how we can then look at surface EMGs with strength and hypertrophy, and, or I should say, or hypertrophy. What did you find in doing this review and in writing this paper? So at present, there are no studies that validate surface EMG as a predictive outcome for strength or hypertrophy. There's one study that uh, it's, it, it attempts to do it for strength, but it doesn't, I would say it doesn't succeed. Uh, basically, they have people do uh, bench press and they have people do push-ups and they kind of normalize the intensity for each using surface EMG. And then following, I forget how many weeks the study was, they tested their... Uh, 
they tested the 1RM for bench press, and I, if I recall correctly, they had the same strength outcomes, so they kind of suggested that uh, surface EMG may be a valid surrogate measure for strength outcomes. But there are a number of things that kind of play into this. It, uh, for example, the range of motion of each exercise, maybe they were more similar. Uh, the loads could have been similar. So there are a number of things that weren't exactly controlled for that may have also been going on within that study that, uh, that they can't say surface EMG alone is predictive. Got it. Fair enough. Okay, and on that, we're going to take a quick 30-second break to hear from our sponsor, NetHealth, and we'll be right back. Are you interested in a free opportunity to check in with the latest thoughts of other rehab leaders? Well, I've got one for you. There's a new online rehab therapy community designed for the intersection of the clinical and business sides of rehab. It's the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum. Catchy name, right? It's all about habits and initiatives that juice up your attendance, revenue, workflows, documentation, compliance, efficiency, and engagement while allowing your provider teams to keep their eye on the prize, their patients and outcomes. I personally believe that a better connected rehab therapy profession has the power to help more people. Jump in, subscribe, and join the conversation today. You can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com healthy. Okay, so we are back. I'm here with Andrew Vygotsky and Nicholas Rolnick, and we are talking about uh, Andrew's paper where he was lead author, Interpreting Signal Amplitudes and Surface EMG Studies in Sport and Rehab Sciences, um, and talked a little bit about the why behind it uh, in the first half. And so now Nick has some interesting questions, so I'll have you go ahead and kind of take it away. Great. So, Andrew, I know we discussed kind of a little bit of the whys behind the EMG and you know in a lot of the experimental designs we talk about standardizing the muscle force in an isometric contraction. Can you discuss why we can't accurately use surface EMG for conditions that involve inducing muscular fatigue? Sure, so there are a number of things that come into it um, or play into it rather. Uh, with fatigue, you're going to get a buildup of metabolites, and these things are going to affect the intracellular and extracellular ion concentrations. And this will, uh, in short, affect the amplitude of the signal. Uh, so that's one reason. So that will be independent of the neural drive going to that muscle. Another thing has to do with the changes in rate coding and recruitment. So a fatigued muscle will change its rate coding properties to uh, basically how often that impulse from the motor neuron goes into the muscle. So with fatigue, since that fatigued fiber will not produce as much force, you need uh, greater rate coding. So that greater rate coding will increase the signal amplitude. So once that increased signal amplitude comes in, you can't really tell what's going on in terms of is that increased muscle force, is it increasing motor unit recruitment, is it increasing rate coding. Uh, so there are a lot of things going on with this, within this, just the amplitude of this signal that you can't really decompose without more advanced techniques. Yeah, so that, that kind of plays into the next segue, which is talking about the difference between extrapolating a surface EMG recording that's in an isometric contraction versus in a dynamic contraction that we commonly see in the clinic. So me as a physical therapist, you know, we bring back the, the gluteus medius example in the clamshell. Well, that's standardized to an isometric contraction. And so every, you know, things in the clinic for the most part are going to be dynamic in nature. So can you talk about kind of the limitations of surface EMG with dynamic muscle contraction and how that would vary from the, the standardized isometric contraction that's done commonly in, in these studies? Sure. So with a dynamic contraction, you're, uh, do you mean that the EMG is measured during a dynamic contraction or extrapolating? Extrapolating static contractions, like static isometric, from a dynamic contraction. Talking about like the skin dynamics, the fluid. The... Okay, so if the surface EMG is located on the skin, right, uh, then the muscle is going to move underneath the skin. So 
if you think about where the motor units are relative to that surface EMG, they're going to be moving either past that surface EMG or they're going to be, uh, that surface EMG may pick up less or more motor units depending on the length of the muscle and the position and the range of motion. And the position of where the EMG is, or where the EMG is placed with right. the, on the muscle. Exactly. Okay. And that, I mean, that introduces a whole other area that's uh, just taking off in research, which is kind of, is one single electrode representative of the entire muscle over which it's placed. And we're still starting to look into that, but it seems that no, it's not, not at all. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and that leads somewhat to my PhD work, but that has to do with, um, we, so we really see these heterogeneities within a single muscle. So if you look at gait, I think there was one study published by Neil Cronin's group, and they showed a range from, I think, 22% to 70% of uh, normalized, they normalized to M-wave maximum uh, EMG amplitude. And that's just within one muscle. So if you look at that one muscle, depending where you look on the muscle, there will be a huge difference. And those are pretty substantial differences, going from 20 to 70% or so. Sure, sure. And so, you know, getting back to uh, Nick's question, can we take this, given all the information you just said, can we take these sort of isometric EMG studies and generalize them to isometric or isotonic exercises in the clinic? Um, I would say that no, because the EMG, number one, the EMG amplitudes elicited are very length and position dependent. So they'll change depending on the length of the muscle, they'll change depending on the position of the joints. So, the, for example, there's one study that looked at biceps and triceps. Um, they actually looked at corticospinal excitability and resulting EMG amplitudes. And corticospinal excitability will change depending on the position of your shoulder. And it may have shown forearm as well, which means that the positions of distal and proximal joints to that muscle will affect the EMG amplitude and the corticospinal excitability, which is a more mechanistic thing that will lead to that. Um, so no, we can't extrapolate anything to different positions per se. Okay, that makes sense. So for instance, Nick was saying, uh, taking that glute med, so if there's a service EMG study on an isometric of a clamshell, looking at the glute med, we can't then say, oh, well, it would be the same thing if we're doing, I don't know, fire hydrants or, or standing on one leg or side to side, you know, stepping with a band in, in a squat position or something like that. I think once you introduce more joints, then things become a lot more yeah. complicated. Yeah. Um, if you're doing a single joint dynamic, things maybe will be able to be extrapolated a bit more. But then again, I would ask, what is the outcome that the practitioner wants? Is it to maximize EMG amplitude or is it for some other variable like strength or hypertrophy or something that may be more relevant to the clinic? So I have a question. <clears throat> so we mentioned before about how a lot of physical therapists clinicians don't really read the method section. So if you're going to recommend uh, someone, say I'm, say I'm going to go read a paper tonight, which I very might well do. If I had to read the method section of a study utilizing EMG, what one thing would you say to look out for? If you're looking to interpret amplitudes, and especially if the amplitudes presented are normalized, I would look in the methods to see what they're normalized to. So is it normalized to some sort of task, for example, gait? Is it normalized to a maximum voluntary asymmetric contraction? Is it normalized to M-wave maximum? Or it could be normalized to a number of things. So depending what that's normalized to, it can totally change how you interpret the amplitudes if you're gonna, especially if you're gonna compare those amplitudes to studies that are other studies. Because ch chances are those other studies aren't gonna be normalized to the same exact thing that that study you're reading is. And I would also imagine that knowing what those studies are normalized to will help you then be able to extrapolate that information to your clinic. Yes, depending what your goals are. Right, depending, exactly, depending on what your goals are and the goals of the patient. So to 
if you're looking at maximum voluntary isometric contractions, and that's what the amplitudes are normalized to, but you're looking to, I don't know, do something more dynamic with a multi-joint movement, then maybe that's not, may not give you the best snapshot of what you need for that patient. Well, I think it's more if you're going to compare that study to other studies. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in my head, I may have like a, a running list of amplitudes for a given muscle. Yeah, in your something. head. What about the average clinician? <laughs> I would probably look elsewhere in the literature to see if there are any, for example, longitudinal strength mm -hmm. studies with strength as a primary outcome rather than uh, surface EMG as a primary outcome in an acute study. So look for studies that are relevant to your patient population, your outcomes. Yeah, and I think that's fair. And I think that's important for clinicians to remember because oftentimes we may read a paper and it maybe the paper is getting a lot of buzz, it's very exciting, and we think, oh, well, it, it said so in this paper, so I can then generalize that to my patient population, and that might not be true. Yeah. More yeah. often than not, probably yeah. is not true. Um, okay, so uh, last question. What is the biggest takeaway for a clinician reading a research study with respect to surface EMG? I would look at all surface EMG studies with a critical eye, especially uh, as they pertain to your patient population, uh, desired patient outcomes. And moreover, I would be skeptical at, uh, with regards to the methodology used, so how are they normalizing things, and especially when comparing those normalized values to the values of other studies. Um, and I would, I guess that's it. It's pretty simple, just don't apply measures that aren't validated to the outcomes you want. That's Fair enough. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, Nick, anything else you want to add? No, I think it was good. I think that that I, I, I personally, before I really got into EMG, had a tendency to do just that, so it's good to, to hear from somebody who is actually working with EMG and producing research. Yeah, to yeah. Tell us not to do that. Exactly. So just kind of like take a step back, control your enthusiasm for a moment, and really ask yourself, is this pertinent to my patient and the goals of this patient and the goals of what I'm trying to achieve? Yeah, All exactly. right. Perfect. All right. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. Nick, thank you so much for coming back and being part of this. And we will have all of this information up on the website at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com. Um, so if anyone has any questions, Andrew, where can they find you? Uh, I am at A. Vygotsky on Twitter. Uh, I'm sure Karen can post that. Yes. Um, you can also find me on Facebook, uh, Andrew Vygotsky, just my profile. And that's about it. Perfect. Nick, where can people find you? On Facebook or Instagram, The Human Performance Mechanic. Post Perfect. Posting fitness videos. Perfect. Well, thanks again, guys. Thanks so much for coming back on, and I really appreciate having you guys here. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. So what a great episode. Thanks to Andrew and Nick for their patience, and of course, I thank them for coming on the podcast again. There's nothing better than when you have a repeat guest. And of course, I do want to thank our sponsor for today's episode, Net Health, but not only for today's episode, but for being an amazing sponsor all year. Uh, so like I said, they have created a new online uh, therapy community called the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forums. You'll see stats on community members already involved, plus some new polls just launched. We'd love you to weigh in. What can you expect that will benefit you? Write-ups, white papers from leading-edge performers, polls, surveys, benchmarking calculators, videos, podcasts, and more. So make sure you go, you check it out. Did I mention it's completely free? Totally free. So you can find the Rehab Therapy Operational Best Practices Forum at www.nethealth.com slash healthy. Thanks everyone for listening. Have a very happy new year and I hope you all have a great start to 2019. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to the podcast at podcast.healthywealthysmart.com and don't forget to follow us on social media.